Good afternoon, I'm Alex for the Rialta Owners Group of America. Today we're going to talk about humidity and condensation issues inside recreational vehicles. If you think of the human body, much like your RV, the RV takes in gas in the form of a liquid, it burns it off and it gives off vapors through the exhaust. Humans, we take in our water, we process it in our bodies, and although we expel it in one way, we also expel more than you'd think in the form of perspiration both through breathing and through actual perspiration coming off of our bodies. This humidity gets into the air, and if there's too much of it in any one given area, not only can it penetrate the surface layers, but it can cause issues as far as mold, mildew, even fungus, and deterioration of the surfaces that are inside our motorhomes that they're literally made from. So we need to learn how to address that, control the humidity, and keep our motorhomes in good shape for the long haul. There's a lot of different methods that are used to control condensation and humidity inside closed spaces, much like your recreational vehicle. One of the most common, of course, is silica. But silica is not necessarily going to take away all the humidity that is inside your motorhome unless you have very large amounts. Where you have very large amounts of moisture, you'll need more silica. Where you add more silica, you add more to the basic weight of your vehicle. Not only the weight of the silica, but when it starts to absorb that moisture, you're also going to increase that amount. Silica also, much to uh, a common misbelief, is not meant to absorb large amounts of water. It's packed along with certain items, including electronics and musical instruments like guitars and so forth, to keep the excess condensation from affecting the surfaces of those particular items. It is not meant to be a major attractant of the humidity that's in the air. There's an awful lot of other wet Zorb products that are on the market, and most of them use something very simple. Sodium chloride. Sodium chloride attracts the water, and as it does, it begins to dissipate itself into the water. It becomes a solution inside. When you see these containers, they usually have two parts to them. There's the main container itself, and then there's a partition. The salt is on top. That's part number one. And then there's a chamber down below for the water to get trapped in. That's part number two. As the water gets accumulated inside there, it goes down into the bottom. Now you have a solution of salt water, which, if not disposed of, is still water sitting inside your motorhome. They need to be checked on a regular basis, replaced, and the new one's checked on, and replaced and so on and so on. It's an ongoing process. You can't just leave it and forget it. And if you do happen to forget it and it's not properly secured, when you're going down the road and that tips over, you've just dumped salt water all over the inside of your recreational vehicle. Now you have two problems. You have salt that's eating away at the metals and the materials and you have a lot of humidity that's helping it along. To help us better control these humidity issues, we should have a basic understanding of where all this humidity comes from. Well, first off, from us, as I explained, in the form of respiration and perspiration, we're putting water into the air. Secondly, if we take our pets along with us, our furry family is also putting that water into the air. I'll give you the figure shortly. It's more than you think. The third is, well, our cups of coffee, when we're cooking, and the ambient air that's outside. If it happens to be a rainstorm, well, obviously there's an extra amount of humidity in the air, and that air that's outside is gonna balance off with the air that's inside our motorhomes, so we're gonna have that same concentration of humidity into the air. In the winter time, when it's cold, it's below freezing, that humidity is not in the air. Why? Because it's frozen and it's into a solid. So in the winter time, we're less likely to have those humidity issues as far as the ambient air goes. But we bring the snow on our feet and on our coats into the vehicle, which then melts from a solid to a liquid. And in the warmth of our environment, which is sealed up tight to keep us warm, it's evaporating back into that humidity, that water in the form of gas. And now in the winter time, we've created a wet issue as well. We're back again today to the Western New York Adult Continuing Education Center so we can try to put these figures into context, something that's easier for all of us to understand. First, let's talk about humans. The average adult human 
will, through respiration and perspiration, give off approximately 2,000 to 2,500 milliliters of water in a 24-hour period. That's just the adults. The kids scale down for size, and you can approximate that. Let's get to the other kids, our furry family, our dogs. And if we're out for an extended trip, we may have one or two of those on board, depending on whether we're pet people or not. So, what do they give off? Well, for the average dog, you can account for about one cup of water for every 24 hours per 10 pounds of animal. So if you have a 30 pound animal, it's three cups of water, average, not exertion, through every 24 hours. That's about 235 milliliters in a cup of water. So now let's take a look at how that is in the big picture. So we plan a road trip. It's gonna take us about six hours to get there. We're planning on being there for the weekend. So between myself for six hours, not so bad. We have the windows open, we can balance out that humidity. And of course I have my traveling companion who's also with me for that six hour trip inside the vehicle. And let's not forget our furry family. Well, maybe we have a couple more friends going with us. Maybe we have a couple of the grandkids with us. That's just for the six hour trip on the way out. Now, let's say that we have uh, a day trip that we're taking to go see a concert somewhere. We have our QD. And we're going to travel to that next city because we want to see that concert that we saw back in high school. So we get our eight passengers and our dog on board. This is what we have just in six hours of day driving. This doesn't even begin to touch the extended periods of time when we're inside the camper and we're sleeping. So you can figure for eight adults, just in a six hour period, you're doing one of these. Now you're not going to have eight adults on board for the full time. So let's break that math down. This is two people in 24 hours. And we only have a 10 pound dog, it's a small dog, so it's just the one cup. In that 24 hour period, this is how much water we're putting into the air just through respiration and perspiration all alone. Let's just say you're going to take a regular old weekend excursion. It's not an extended trip on the road. It's not boondocking. You're just getting out of town, going to stretch your legs for a little bit. You're going to leave on a Friday. You're going to come back on a Sunday. Nice, short, easy weekend trip. Well, the first leg of the trip, just six hours with just two adults. Just the time that you're inside the RV itself. You're giving off 1,200 milliliters through respiration and perspiration into the air inside the RV. The overnight sleeping, once you're there, because you're going to get there and you're going to set up, you're going to have your food, you're going to do whatever. You're going to come in, you're going to spend a little time there, but I'm just going to count the eight hours that you're actually physically sleeping. Again, based upon two adults. That comes in at around 1,600 milliliters combined throughout that night. This is based on just around 100 milliliters per hour that's given off by the average individual. Now, Saturday, we've got a lot of stuff to do, so we're going to spend two hours in there. We're going to have our breakfast, we're going to have our dinner, we might stop back and change clothes depending on what's going on. So in those two hours between the two of us, that's only 400 milliliters. Now we have our overnight stay again. It's another eight hours, so it's another 1,600 milliliters of water put into that air. Sunday, we get up and we pack up our campsite. And we do our little bit of traveling that's there, but I'm not going to count the little bit of traveling that might be around in that nice little town that you're visiting. We're just going to count the trip on the way back when you're most likely to have those windows closed up, maybe the air conditioning on or the heat on, depending on the weather. So that's another six hours. So we're looking at another 1,200 
milliliters into the air. Just the time that you're in the camper, just for travel, a little clothes changing, and you're sleeping. Over that one weekend, you've put in 6,000 milliliters of water vapor into that air. Putting that in context again, 6,000 milliliters of water before we talk about boiling any soup, making any coffee, making any tea, or spending any extra time inside the RV. So now that we've talked about the ways that we add the humidity into the air, let's talk about the ways that we can control it or eliminate it. One of the first ways is ventilation. If the humidity is higher on one side than it is on the other, it's going to travel to where the humidity is lower. Just the same as where it's drier, it's going to pull that humidity in, unless there's a barrier in place. So, ventilation, if it's very moist inside while you're sleeping because of all the respiration and perspiration that you're doing, and the temperature outside is comfortable enough, ventilation is a key factor. Having windows open, having fans blowing that help turn sweat into vapor, which dissipates, is gonna be one of the key things that you can do. The second one is refrigeration. Refrigeration in and of itself takes the humidity out of the air, condensates it either into a liquid or into a solid so that it is no longer in the air. This is how basic air conditioning works. Air conditioning does not add cold to an environment. Quite the opposite. What it does is it takes away the heat. Cold is the absence of heat. Heat is not the absence of cold, it's the presence of heat. One of the things that it needs to do is take the components out of the air that hold the heat. When we turn on a standard household air conditioner, the first action that it takes is to remove the humidity from the air. You may have noticed when you have a window unit, like this one, in your house, that on the inside, while it's functioning and you hear the fan going, on the outside, there's a drip. The moisture is coming away. It's very much the same as, well, when you have a cold soda or a glass of iced tea and it's sitting outside and the droplets begin to form on the outside, you're taking that humidity, that water in the form of a gas in the air, and it's condensating on the outside of that cold surface, that glass of iced tea. The air conditioning system has a similar function. Its first action is to remove the humidity from the environment. Once the humidity, which helps retain the heat, is removed, it's easy to remove the balance of the heat, leaving behind what's cold. So going back to the refrigeration, when the air conditioning unit is on, preferably the rooftop model, when you're out there boondocking or camping, even if you're running it on low, it will continually remove the moisture from the air. And the condensate is visible because it's coming down those drains and you see that puddle forming on the ground. The last one is called condensation for the purpose of this lecture. Condensation is the action of using those chemicals that we talked about earlier, such as the potassium chloride or the sodium chloride in the dry boxes, that causes that humidity in the air to condensate again and then become trapped inside those vessels. Of all the different forms, that is the least effective for large amounts of moisture. Don't get a false sense of security just because you have moisture absorbed containers around the inside of your vehicle. They're great when you're not using your vehicle to keep extra humidity and moisture out of there should there be any trapped inside, such as during storage. But when you're out on the road and you're using it actively, this is never going to be a sufficient method of getting rid of the humidity that you're putting inside your recreational vehicle. When temperatures are above freezing, water evaporates. It goes from the form of a liquid into a gas and that's the humidity that's in the air. Anytime you have a temperature and pressure change, you can cause condensation to occur. This can happen inside the RV, it can happen inside layers inside the RV, it can happen almost anywhere. The presence of the moisture in excessive amounts is our concern because the moisture penetrating these materials can also contribute to the growth of mold, mildew, and fungus, which destroys the materials inside and makes the breathing air unhealthy. So, in the winter time, when the temperatures are below freezing, that humidity in the air gets taken away. 
But as I mentioned earlier, if we're coming into our RV wearing our boots and our coats and we have a lot of snow on those and we don't get rid of that water, it's going to melt and it's going to evaporate and then we're going to trap that moisture inside the RV. So using things like deep lug car mats and making sure that you remove as much snow and ice from yourself before you climb in is exceedingly important. In the summertime, as you're traveling, having the air conditioning on, even the coach air as you're driving down the road, whatever it takes to allow that system to take the moisture out of the air is going to be a benefit to you. Running it on low, especially at night when you're inside there sleeping, is also going to remove a lot of the extra humidity from the inside of your motorhome and help prevent further damage. Last but not least, let's talk about mold and mildew issues if you find them. First of all, remember that these are things that we do not want to breathe. So if you discover it, leave it undisturbed until you know how to deal with it and what you need to take care of it. Secondly, the only way to determine the difference between the different types of mold and mildews and what is more dangerous than the other is actually to perform a lab test. You can either call an environmental technician to go ahead and perform this test for you, although there are kits that are available at most of the larger home centers where you can draw a sample yourself, set it off, and the lab will return the results to you telling you what they have found that's in that particular sample. As a basic rule of thumb, the more dangerous molds tend to grow in places that are warm, wet, and dark. They usually don't grow in direct sunlight, although that's not exclusive. Mildews, however, can grow anywhere. We see them grow on the outside of our RVs where we're parked under a tree for more than two days. And we'll actually see that mossing, that mildew taking place on the outside of the vehicle. These are all easily remedied in open air with a solution of bleach and water and careful cleaning. Never put yourself in a confined space if you find that that space contains mold or mildew until you are properly educated on what's there and how it needs to be handled. If you're not up to the task or you're feeling uncertain, again, your best cause to an environmental tech. The owner's manual clearly states that your motorhome was designed primarily for recreational and short-term occupancy and that if you expect to occupy your coach for an extended period, be prepared to deal with condensation and humid conditions that may be encountered. Moisture condensing on the inside of your windows is a visible indication that there is too much humidity inside the coach and excessive moisture can cause water stains or mildew which can damage interior items such as upholstery and the cabinets. You can help reduce excessive moisture inside the motorhome by taking precautions. So remember, even though the Rialto was never intended to replace your home full time, with proper care and proper maintenance, the Rialto or any RV will give you many years of safe, reliable, comfortable adventures for years to come. For the Rialto Owners Group of America, I'm Alex. Have a great day.